that Alex and I and some other folks in the directorate did over the past few years uh, to explore the idea of what we can do with lunar resources. So should we burn the moon? The answer is it depends. Thank you for coming to my talk. Everybody have a good day. I could add one or two more words. First, I do want to thank there are a number of folks who have contributed to this work over the years. A few of them are here in the room. Others are probably online or uh, hiding away from the discussion here. But uh, this was really an effort across the directorate to understand the value of what resources on the moon could potentially provide as NASA is pushing forward with new plans for human exploration of the moon and then on to Mars. So to that end, why are we here to have this conversation? Well, as I say, NASA has the Moon to Mars program. It has Artemis. It is working on having a human lunar return in the next few years and eventually working its way to sending humans on to Mars. Uh, we are trying to get people out of low Earth orbit for the first time in decades. And this is probably the biggest thrust across the entirety of NASA's human exploration venture. We have also come to know, especially since the last time we were on the moon, that there are potential deposits and potentially copious deposits of water ice other volatiles, things that we could use in order to make propellant to move things around on the moon or to get off the moon or to take into orbit to then use elsewhere. So if we were able to achieve industrial scales, tens of tons of hydrogen and oxygen production from water ice and hydrogen and oxygen being a very useful propellant for moving around in space, that could really transform how we operate in space going forward. It could be something that reduces the need to send all of the mass we need for a mission, especially a mission to Mars, from the Earth and launched out of Earth's very deep gravity well. It could enable a greater degree of resiliency in the ways that we operate. We wouldn't be solely dependent on a supply chain that traces all the way back to Kennedy Space Center in order to get everything off the ground. We could live off the land a little bit. And ultimately, this could help promote a larger cislunar economy where NASA or large government agencies are not the only people playing in cislunar space on the moon going to Mars, but it could be thriving and the production of propellant could be a part of that. That's the positive side of the story. The other side, of course, is we don't actually know where explicitly to find any ice on the moon. We don't have the systems to do that, and we don't have a system of vehicles that are going to go, say, to Mars that actually would significantly use this. So while there is a potential for a tremendous impact in how we do human space exploration, there's a number of caveats that are very relevant here. Our story in SACD here begins in 2016 when some folks at MIT published a paper that showed that you could get a 68 percent reduction in the amount of mass you had to launch from the Earth in order to do a human mission to Mars by using lunar resources. 68% is a lot. Uh, Mars missions are typically, you know, order of magnitude, you need like a thousand tons in low Earth orbit or somewhere near Earth in order to actually send humans to Mars, have them do something meaningful there and come back. So reducing that quantity by hundreds of tons and all of the associated launches has the potential to be a very meaningful thing. And that's just for one mission. But as we went and looked into the analysis there, we saw that those caveats I just described, the fact that you need those systems to do it and such, you have to factor those into the decision too. You don't just get to skip right ahead to a 68% mass savings. You have to design and build the systems that are gonna do that and be able to operate them. So we did some analysis initially looking at what was in this paper here in order to better understand where it was good, where it wasn't, and ultimately to help NASA decide, okay, we need to know more before we can decide if this is really a way that we want to start investing in changing the architecture we use to send humans to Mars or changing the investments that we make in developing technologies and capabilities. So to that end, that and the arrival of uh, Artemis and, and eventually Moon to Mars as major objectives of the agency led us to ask the question of how does propellant delivery from Earth compared to propellant produced on the moon and used for various operations on the basis of cost rather than mass, because frankly, NASA has to make a lot of its decisions based on dollars rather than just on what is the most technically promising solution to a given problem. So we wanted to explore this and build out that understanding. And to that end, we started what I colloquially like to refer to as the paper factory, 
exploring this from a number of different angles to understand this problem better. So we started by saying, okay, let's take this question and dive into it. What does it mean to do in situ resource utilization, ISRU, on the moon? And what does it mean to do that specifically to enable a human Mars mission? The idea being that, hey, I make propellant on the moon from lunar ice, I ship that up into some orbit near the moon, I then transfer that to whatever vehicles I'm using to go to Mars, and now I've reduced the need to send all of that propellant all the way from the Earth's surface to the moon. Instead, I can just get it off the moon, a much smaller delta V, a much smaller energy budget, a much more efficient approach if all the systems are in place. We started there. What we found, and I'll talk a little bit about the results here in a second is, okay, that's not necessarily always the most promising thing because of all the upfront work you have to do to have that capability. And the fact that you're hauling all of that propellant from the place you made it, the surface of the moon, up into lunar orbit. That's still a few kilometers per second of delta V. So you're using some of the propellant you made in order to get the propellant you're actually going to use where you're going to use it. So what if we use it for human lunar missions? What if we can use this propellant we make a little bit closer to home? Now you're using it to say, return the crew from the surface of the moon back up into space to come home as part of an Artemis mission. This potentially opens up a much more promising and direct return on the investment of this capability relative to the longer term. Well, that's Mars, that's the moon. What if we put the story together and we look at if in the near term, NASA plans to send humans to the moon, but they're doing that in part to prepare to send humans to Mars, how does Lunar ISRU potentially fit into an overarching campaign that covers both of those desires? So we essentially brought together what we had done in the first two papers, improved our modeling, and looked at this as an integrated question. I'm going to dive into some more detail about this one because this was really, I think, the, the paper that brought a lot of this together. Then we realized there's still a ton of other open questions we could explore, starting with, well, we made some assumptions about what that mission to the moon might look like and how much propellant it might need, but that was just one assumption and not one we could explore in great detail in papers two and three. So paper four became about, well, depending on the nature of the vehicles you're trying to refuel and how you allocate different functions among different vehicles, that can drive that propellant demand. And that propellant demand in turn can drive when does making propellant on the moon actually pay off or not. So. I'm going to summarize three of the four papers here and go into a little bit more detail of the other and then talk a little bit about some of the future research directions we identified and then throw it open to all of you to add some thoughts. So paper one, Lunar ISRU for human Mars missions. What we wanted to explore here, as I said, is how does delivering propellant from Earth compare to producing propellant on the moon when we look at it on the basis of cost? Most previous studies typically address this from a purely mass perspective. And as is probably well known in the community of space mission design, space campaigning, however you want to define it, cost and mass are very closely correlated. The more stuff you need to put into space, the more cost you're paying for those systems and the vehicles that deliver them and the launch vehicles and the ground operations. So at a very basic level, reducing mass would reduce cost, but not all mass is created equal propellant, all things considered, is relatively cheap compared to advanced systems that can autonomously, oh, say, mine ice and convert it into propellant and store it and transfer it into an autonomous vehicle that then goes into space and delivers that propellant for somebody else to use. That's a little bit more complicated. So to that end, uh, we wanted to look at this on a cost basis to understand when and where does it make sense rather than just look at the mass savings. And this is important because it's going to take a lot of money for NASA to send humans to the moon and onto Mars. And if we can make investments that significantly reduce that, that makes it easier to do, that gives us margin if things go up in price, that enables a wider spectrum of things for NASA to approach, and vice versa, if we spend a lot of money on a capability that ends up not paying off, we may get some interesting spinoffs from that, but we will not have succeeded at trying to improve the situation that we're trying to address directly. How do we make it easier to send humans to Mars? So this is a single figure of results from the paper here. I just want to spend a minute talking about it. Uh, if you would like more detail, I am more than happy to provide you with these papers if you would like to explore it in a little further or chat anytime. But essentially, we looked at the question of if you're planning to do a long term campaign of human missions to Mars where you're going to send several missions in succession and the total duration of that runs for 14 years, 
we had done some analysis that showed you needed about 59 tons per year of oxygen and hydrogen propellant in cislunar space, whether that's near the gateway or in an orbit like a Lagrange point or somewhere near the moon, in order to do what was NASA's architecture that of interest at the time. And what we then did is looked at a few different architectures for getting that from the Earth, namely you launch all of that propellant either on the space launch system or on a series of commercial vehicles, or you build the systems you need to go and get that propellant off the moon. You send a few SLS flights with landers to bring down hardware to produce propellant. They produce it, fuel those landers to carry some of that propellant back up into space. And eventually over time, you build out a large enough capacity on the moon and a large enough capacity moving things from the moon to cislunar space to provide that 59 tons per year, at which point, hey, now you can go off and have a Mars mission. What we learned in doing this is that those architectures to do it for the moon were significantly more expensive in terms of the dollars you had to spend per kilogram of propellant you made than getting that from Earth. The best option using ISRU in our modeling and in our assumptions cost about $78,000 per kilogram of propellant produced, while the best approach overall, which was delivering the propellant on a series of commercial launches from Earth, was basically half that, $40,000 per kilogram. So in the course of this analysis and the sensitivities we did around it, what we learned is that the best lunar ISRU approach was essentially twice as expensive, and by twice as expensive, I mean $31 billion, more expensive than getting that propellant from the Earth. So at least as a starting point here, lunar ISRU for Mars, not as straightforwardly attractive, at least, as just saying it's a chance to save mass because you've got to pay the costs for the systems that do that. You've got to pay the costs to maintain the systems that do that over that long duration. So as I said, we followed that up by saying, let's bring things a little closer to home. What does it look like if you need to only produce propellant for missions that are operating from the lunar surface into cislunar space and back again? And how does that compare? In this case, the reason why this was of interest is that there's an increasing push to develop commercial capabilities to deliver payloads to the lunar surface. Folks may be familiar with the CLIPS program, seeing the work that folks like SpaceX and Blue Origin are doing to provide human landing systems. There's a push to have a wider diversity of ways to bring propellant to the moon or any other payload. So having just seen there that for the sake of doing missions to Mars, commercial delivery of propellant was attractive, maybe this commercial delivery of propellant would also pay off better on the moon versus producing it from lunar resources. And again, one of the things we realized as we were doing this is there's the technological capabilities to produce that propellant, build those landers and get them to operate. But the campaign considerations, what are you actually doing on the moon? How long are you going to be there? What do you need? How frequently are you sending humans there and back again? All of those things actually end up driving the trade as much, if not more, than the technical performance parameters of the size and the power requirements of the ISRU system or the cost of the lander that's hauling these propellants back and forth. So we also, thanks to the work of Alex and Matteo, a couple of the co-authors there, got much better figures, as you can see. And what we learned here is that as the duration of time you spent on the moon increased, which is moving left to right on the axis here, and as the amount of propellant you needed per year, because you're doing a more and more ambitious set of missions to the moon, that's the tons per year on the y-axis, the better ISRU starts to look relative to just getting your propellant from the Earth. The red hashed area, you're better off sending your propellant from Earth the old fashioned way. The yellow trending towards the blue, now you're actually getting a cost break even where the amount of cost you spend in order to do this entire campaign by building those systems and mining ice on the moon actually is a more cost-effective option than getting it from the Earth. One of the other things we looked at is how much does the reliability or the expected lifetime of those ISRU systems impact things? And as it turned out, quite a bit there. Depending on how often you needed to replace these ISRU systems over the course of this lunar campaign, the, uh, the year at which you might achieve that break even could significantly shift until it kind of plateaus out at a certain level of reliability. As you can see with the three lines here, there's also a dependence on the demand on the moon. Again, the scope of what you're doing on the moon is just as big a driver here as this more technical performance of the system lifetime of the systems that's making that propellant.
So it could provide significant cost savings if you are going to be at the moon for a while, if you're going to be doing significantly large scale missions that require a lot of propellant, then it's worth it to make it there. But one of the things that really drove that was understanding the reliability of those systems. So we kept that in mind as we then came to our kind of capstone question. What does this look like if we're doing this for both missions to the moon and missions to Mars in succession as part of a grander moon to Mars campaign? Where does it make sense in order to do this or what needs to be the reality in terms of technical capabilities and what needs to be the reality in terms of the campaign in order for this break even to appear? The reason why we wanted to do this, of course, is in the emerging context of the last few years, this is where NASA plans to take human spaceflight. We're going to have a series of Artemis missions that bring crew to the moon and build up a more sustained presence there. But we still very much intend to send humans on to Mars and be able to further our exploration of the solar system. And the value of Lunar ISRU, we were starting to get hints of this from the previous papers, but we really wanted to explore it here, hinges on the technical and the programmatic decisions that NASA is going to make. So understanding this is just as useful for informing someone who is working on maturing a technology as it is for somebody at headquarters who is trying to understand the big picture implications of planning something for uh, the next 20 years of human spaceflight. So that led us to explore a few different variables and I'll dive into more detail here, but first I wanna spend a moment here on the results to again explain how we looked at the results and the answers here. The x-axis is how long you spend doing human missions on the moon before you transition to doing human missions to Mars. So the longer you go, the further you go left to right on that axis, that's more time that's being spent with those lunar missions that, as we saw in paper two, tended to see some payoff if you were spending long times on the moon. The y-axis, the inert mass fraction of a reusable lander, that was essentially the big technology parameter for how efficient is the lander that has to convey propellant from the lunar surface up to cislunar space to enable a Mars mission and then land back down again. Lower numbers here are better. There are more efficient designs. More of the mass can be spent on payload relative to the propellant to push that payload up and down. And again, with the color scheme here, the white area, ISRU is not breaking even. This cost ratio is greater than one, than one and you're better off doing delivery from Earth and not investing in all the technologies here relative to the costs of investing in all those capabilities. As you move from the yellow to the green to the blue and those numbers come down, now ISRU is paying off. And especially as you get into those deeper colors, it's paying off by enough that we're probably accounting for some of the uncertainty baked into trying to do this modeling and this forecasting of systems that are still potentially decades out. So what we learned in the course of doing the paper, and I'm about to walk you through that, is that it was that lunar campaign, more so than whatever you were planning to do for sending humans to Mars, that actually drove did ISRU break even or not? And if those systems could not be very long life and could not be very high performance, then no matter what you were doing on the moon, your Mars mission preferred to still get its propellant from the Earth's surface rather than the lunar surface, even if you might have already built some of that lunar capability up. So what we did in the course of diving into this paper is we started with a very basic definition of the campaign we were exploring with six variables here. The first is that pre-transition duration that you saw on the x-axis. How long are we spending sending humans to the moon and supplying them with the propellant to come back home again before we start sending humans to Mars? Then how long does the Mars mission itself last? This value we took from our previous study, the 14 years, but we did explore some sensitivities around it that I'll show in a minute. How much propellant did we need on the moon before the transition took place? As I said, we did a study which suggested that a good reference number to work from is 17 tons of oxygen and hydrogen propellant per year for that five to 15 years that we've got humans on the moon. But again, we then explored a sensitivity around this value to understand how much it was driving the behavior. There's also how much propellant do you need in cislunar space? Before this, we assume you're not doing anything like building up capabilities or going to Mars with a robotic mission as a precursor. So we assume that the ISRU architecture or the architecture delivering propellant from Earth, it doesn't have any responsibilities to put propellant in cislunar space before the transition point. 
after the transition, now there's the amount of propellant you need in the year, which again was the 59 tons per year figure we showed in paper one. And we assumed that, okay, let's pretend for a moment that the lunar missions actually wrap up at that point and we don't need to sustain things. So our starting assumption there was we would fall down to zero tons per year needed to be used on the lunar surface. But again, it's still be to be determined exactly how the full nature of the moon to Mars campaign is going to play out. So we also looked at a situation where that 17 tons per year would be sustained even while the Mars missions were going on. So this gave us a reference case to work from both to understand things like the nature of our models, as well as to then iterate on to do some of our initial sensitivity analysis. I've kind of talked through this a little bit by words, but let me offer a picture here of the two architectures we're looking at. So the left hand side here is what I've called the propellant delivery architectures. This is where you have a launch vehicle, be it an SLS, be it a commercial vehicle that is responsible for launching some lander containing propellant either to the lunar surface to enable human moon missions or to cis lunar space to enable human Mars missions. The right hand side simply introduces that that lander is also responsible for landing that ISRU hardware, that system that's going to take lunar ice, convert it to propellant, and enable that to be transferred back into the lander. So that sits on the surface. The lander now potentially moves between the lunar surface and cislunar space in order to deliver propellant and come back down. And that's our propellant production or our ISRU architecture, the two things we're comparing here. In the course of the modeling, there's kind of three major elements that fit here within this pyramid schematic of what we did. The first is the launch vehicle itself. We assumed a capability for the SLS of 40 tons of payload to cislunar space at a billion dollars a year, or a reference commercial capability at 15 tons a year and or 15 tons per vehicle and $200 million per shot. And this would define the capability that then was used to size the lander burning oxygen, hydrogen at an ISP of about 450 seconds and varying that, inert mass, varying that inert mass fraction to explore just how capable the vehicle could be and what that did to the trade-off in costs. Finally, we then modeled the ISRU systems themselves, both with respect to a system that was fairly efficient and a system that really could push the technology forward and reduce the amount of mass and power you needed on the moon. That's what we call the MREE model and the Duke model. The details aren't important. What matters here is we looked at two different levels of capability for ISRU in terms of how efficient they are in order to understand, is this where investing your dollars really pays off in making the difference is by pushing on the ISRU technology versus pushing on the lander versus deciding to send more frequent missions to the moon or to Mars and ultimately building cost models that enabled us to consider, as I said, the cost and not just the mass here. So where that took us is beyond the initial results I showed you, it allowed us to explore what some of these questions meant. So in this case, we were comparing those two models, the MREE in the top row and the Duke model in the bottom row, and looking again at that ISRU system lifetime parameter that we saw in paper two was a pretty big driver. And what we see here is, okay, if it's only a one year lifetime, if you're replacing these ISRU systems every year because they break down or you need new ones, uh, this graph stays purely white. There is no place where it pays off to do the ISRU because you're spending so much money replacing it all the time that you're not making back any savings by virtue of getting your propellant from the moon. At a three year lifetime, it now makes a major difference how efficient the system is. At the level of efficiency on the top row with the MREE, still doesn't break even. At the level of efficiency with the Duke model, the more efficient ISRU system, now we actually see some regions where if the vehicle can be efficient enough, then regardless of the duration of the time we spend on the moon, yeah, ISRU looks attractive. At a five-year lifetime, even MREE has a few slivers of cases in that lower right-hand corner, and Duke looks a little bit better. Although you'll see there's not actually a ton of shift there in the behavior, so it was really that first jump up to three years of lifetime that made a difference. We'll explore that a little bit more in just a second. But ultimately, it's having the highly reliable, high-performing ISRU systems that really matter for driving home whether or not it makes sense to do this across a combined campaign. And also that we want to do it for longer lunar campaigns. Uh, second thing we did, it was exploring those demands that I talked about. So we said 17 tons per year for the lunar demand. That's the, the difference between the top and the bottom rows here. And we looked at going above and below that 59 tons per year for what we eventually needed to do Mars missions. 
And in this case, I'm just using the Duke model. I'm just using the more efficient one, and I'm just using that lifetime of three years. As we saw in the previous plot, that's really the first case in terms of technological capability where there's a significant amount of payoff in terms of the amount of area in the graph here that has color and thus shows an ISRU savings. What you can see here is if you compare the differences moving left to right versus the differences moving top to bottom, it's that change in the demand on the moon that actually significantly changes the story here. There's not that much sensitivity to the demand that's wanted, the Mars demand, in terms of influencing when and where that break even occurs, but there is as soon as we doubled that lunar demand from 17 to 34 tons. I'm showing 47, 59, and 71 here. We did explore farther out past 71, and actually the behavior we saw, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, is as that demand on Mars increased, oftentimes the overall trade more and more favored not ISRU, but getting the propellant from Earth. But what we learned here is it's the decisions that NASA makes in the near term about what kind of lunar campaign they're going to do, more so than the future plans for the Mars missions that actually determine whether or not ISRU would break even. All right, the third side of things here is let's talk now about time and reliability. So the difference between the top and the bottom rows here is that three-year lifetime we've been assuming or making a perhaps a little too optimistic of an assumption that the ISRU systems are infinitely reliable. We just need to maintain them, but they don't ever get so worn down that we need to replace them. And thus we're able to reduce the amount of mass we continue to send to the moon to sustain this capability. Moving left to right is how long is the duration of that Mars campaign? At 10 years, we're probably looking at something on the order of two to three human missions to Mars. 14, probably three, maybe four if the timing works out right. 20, now you might be fitting as many as five round trips to Mars with all of the pre-deployments and such in between. And what we learn here is at the three-year row, it's a little hard to see, but the situation actually gets worse and worse for ISRU the more time you're spending supplying those Mars missions with ISRU which is a bit of a surprising result. A lot of people think, oh, if I can live off the land, if I can make resources you know, somewhere else besides the Earth, that's only gonna get better the longer I'm spending doing it. But because of the nature of what we were modeling and the amount of cost it spent to maintain those capabilities, the longer you spent doing this, the worse the situation looked for living off the land. Unless the system was much better. As soon as you move to this bottom row here, now you see the left to right progression, more of the color comes in. There are more cases where the use of ISRU is actually paying off. So now, if you can get the systems to be extremely high performing, then you live in that world that maybe is one starting assumption of, ah, I'm living off the land, I'm using the resources of the solar system, and that's enabling me to do more and more. But again, you get these sometimes unintuitive behaviors here, diving in and looking at what's going on, and so what it tells us is that, you know, for a high ISRU lifetime, yes, this could be attractive, but it still may not be the absolute slam dunk, yes, unless those systems become extremely reliable or extremely capable, or we take some other dramatic advancement forward, either in the nature of the campaigns we're doing or the technologies we use. So as I say, this was kind of the capstone of what we looked at here, which then spun off a whole bunch of other questions we wanted to explore. We got a chance to dive into one and then the nature of what we were working on kind of pivoted. And so we've got a few more that are open questions. But one of the things we did get to explore is, OK, we just saw that that difference between 17 tons per year and 34 tons per year made a pretty big difference back here when we were looking at these results. So how do we get a better handle on whether it is 17 or it is 34 or it's something in between or it's something outside of that territory entirely? So what we wanted to explore is how do the assumptions and the decisions that NASA and its partners are starting to make around how we're going to explore the moon begin to impact what that propellant demand is that's then going to inform that break even. Uh, obviously, different uh, providers for the human landing system are looking at different architectures. NASA has explored different things in its own reference concepts. Other providers like CLIPS or, or even other country space agencies may go a different route and understanding how they break out what different vehicles do in the architecture can potentially drive what that demand is and therefore, does it make sense to push on lunar ISRU? Uh, as I say, it can also impact the degree to which you're relying on Earth. It can impact how much reusability you might need. And all of these things come into play in determining 
how the answers we just showed in paper three might shift. So we looked at a few different architectures. I'm going to focus on two here. The top one is the case where you have a single stage vehicle that goes from the lunar orbit all the way down to the lunar surface and back again. Uh, it's responsible for the two plus kilometers per second of the descent burn, the two plus kilometers per second of the ascent burn, pushing crew through that entire time. In the bottom architecture, you actually use several different elements to handle these different delta Vs. There's a reusable transfer vehicle, that's the little green one on the right, that moves the stack, the rest of the vehicles, between cis lunar space and low lunar orbit, doing a, a fraction of the delta V. That goes back up to cis lunar space, while a descent element, that middle piece in blue, then is what actually brings the rest of the hardware down to the lunar surface. It gets left behind, and the ascent element, the one on the left in the original set in yellow, comes back up. So now you're using three different vehicles to do the functions of the single vehicle in the top one. And what we learned there is, depending on what you were choosing to do with those uh, functions and where you were doing your propellant, you could see some pretty radical differences here in this parameter is the amount of propellant mass you need as a function of the mass of the crew system that you're bringing down. So it's a partial derivative, dm prop over dm crew, which basically says for every kilogram of crew hardware I need to bring down, these, uh, these single stage vehicles here with the 14s, I need 14 kilograms of propellant to do that. If I'm either doing all of my propellant refueling solely in cislunar space, that's the first column, or I'm doing it entirely on the surface with, say, ISRU in the third column. If I'm doing a partial blend of things, though, suddenly that situation improves dramatically, and I'm now down at about two kilograms of propellant per kilogram of crude payload here. There's a big sensitivity, as you can see here, depending on that assumption of where you're doing your refueling, which goes away in this three element architecture. The three element architecture is not as good. It's up there as you can see as like four for the case where you're doing all of your refueling in cislunar space and about two and a half when you're doing your refueling at a mix of cislunar space and on the surface. So it's not the best case, but it's a lot less sensitive to that choice because of the nature of splitting those functions across multiple vehicles. So again, what this taught us here is that additional vehicles could help reduce those steady state demands, certainly compared to some of the worst cases with a single vehicle. But ultimately, those choices of function and refueling, they drive the sensitivity and the behavior of the system. They determine how much the efficiency of any one of those elements then contributes to the overall demand story and thus contributes to the overall cost question. Or they would if we got around to finishing the study there. We got a chance to do the first paper four, paper 4A we called it, which explored what we just talked about there. What we didn't quite get a chance to get around to is taking those results back into what we looked at and saying, so how does that impact the cost break even now that we can get a better understanding of what happens to the propellant demand on the moon? We had a few other directions we wanted to explore as well, and we may still get to them someday. One is, well, what happens if you don't commit to either a purely propellant delivered from Earth architecture or a purely propellant produced on the ISRU architecture, but you could do something as a hybrid in between. You could try and find a best of both worlds scenario where different propellant needs at different times could scale whether they came from Earth or the Moon, and what did that do to the trade-off? And of course, I think as you probably all noticed, a lot of those sensitivities I showed were very deterministic in nature. We picked a few discrete points, we evaluated those, we learned some things from that, but bringing in stochastic modeling around the uncertainties within the definition of the campaign, around the uncertainties around the definition of the technologies, around the uncertainties in our cost models of things, that could also enable us to get a better understanding of what's actually driving those behaviors I just showed you. Is it the uncertainty in our modeling or is it the actual real effects of these trade-offs? So, should we burn the moon? Like I said, it depends. It's a function of a lot of different variables that intermingle together and that mean that there's a lot of different people whose expertise and understanding comes into play to answer what starts off as seeming to be a very straightforward question there. So what I wanna leave you with here and open it up is kind of two questions that I'm particularly interested in, which is what else should we explore here now that we've started understanding this trade space, but by no means have come to some definitive conclusion and what other kinds of questions does this raise for you? Where else do you see a question like this of, when does it make sense to do thing X instead of thing Y? And 
where could this potentially apply or where do you think it could apply for things we look at uh, here at NASA? So with that, thank you all for your time and I'll take your questions. Oh, you'll let me pick. Okay, we'll go right here. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask about uh, some of the plots for the, uh, I think it was in paper three where you were showing the the break even points. Um, there, there was a feature. Uh, um, yeah, if we can go back. Yep. Yeah, that that bump. That the bubble. Yeah. What what's going on there? Yeah, the bubble was weird. The bubble puzzled us for a while as we were working on this. Um, let me see if I remember exactly, and Alex, feel free to jump in if, if you can recall the explanation as well. But the bubble here happened because the nature of how we sized the ISRU systems and the landers to fit within the launch vehicles together. These are discrete ISRU systems being fit with a more continuously sized lander within a constraint of the launch vehicle. So the behavior would sometimes get a little weird at boundary conditions where, oh, if you just slightly tweak this variable, now you need one more ISRU plant and you need one more vehicle and so forth and so on. And so it generates behavior that's not nearly as smooth as what you see throughout the rest of the space here. Okay, thank you. Sure. faster. Um, Cause my question is actually related to this slide. So I'm curious the level of detail that goes behind some of these studies. And the example I want to ask you about is, so you say here the lifetime of your ISRU system and you like three and eight. Mm -hmm. it, do you look at things like, um, you know, this technology has to be developed, I guess, right? We don't have it now. We know fundamentally, just as one example, dust mitigation is a huge problem, right? So, so do you... Does this study go into enough detail to say here are the potential things that could actually achieve this as an ISRU system? And and you know, because of some fundamental issue, like maybe eight is not even relevant to think about because there's no way we'll get there. So do you actually go into that level of detail or do you just pick three and eight and some numbers, you know? It's much more of the latter than the former. It was it was based around exploring the campaign implications rather than getting into detailed designs of the systems, which I think is a very valid direction to go because yes, what this series of studies can do is say if you could get to this level of capability here's where it pays off an entirely separate question is how feasible is it to get to that capability is dust mitigation going to eat us alive is the need for these systems to probably operate autonomously for years at a time and all of the capabilities it takes to do that is that going to cause this to break down um, one kind of baked in assumption here that i didn't state but it comes with it is again we don't actually know where we would find these extremely copious and accessible amounts of ice on the moon in order to then bring them and use them in the first place. It may turn out that it's going to be an extremely hard technical challenge just to go exploring the permanently shadowed region of a crater, mine that ice, get it back without losing it all the sublimation, and process it into the propellant, even independent of having these systems. So we did try in the course of the papers to frame what we were doing in the context of this is answering some of the trade space, some of the questions, but it's definitely not getting at all of them. The questions of could you actually build this capability or is there actually ice to go get that's accessible in the quantities you need? We very much tried to emphasize those are other questions you have to answer before you can make a genuine judgment and get anywhere beyond just saying it depends. John, I'll come to you and then Nalan will come to you. Okay, um, so your assumption of the two hundred million dollar launch vehicle is obviously Falcon Heavy esque. Um, when you think about the, at least the potential, and I know it's not real yet for Starship to kind of between ten and the theoretical hundred, I don't really believe, but you know, a ten x improvement in the launch cost would to would mean that your break even point is at the point one level. And uh, on these all these plots, meaning like dark purple that doesn't quite even really exist. And then to, in my mind with NASA's kind of uh, risk uh, adverse posture, if you're anywhere flirting with the line of one, your answer is it's not going to happen. You're going to need to beat it by a factor of two or five or ten or you know, something large in order to do all this extra work. So um, where is the uh, it, basically? Are people thinking about the fact that Starship could mitigate the entire concept? 
I think some people are. I see Dale grinning here because he and I have had this conversation on a number of occasions. Um, because yes, one of the things that we realized even before this study, but it especially proved out here is as the cost to send stuff into space becomes less and less, and it's already come down some and Starship could knock it down a whole lot more, that does fundamentally alter that calculus of, oh, we must always strive to reduce mass on our Mars missions or our any missions because every dollar or every kilogram we're putting in space costs so many dollars of launch vehicle. If that so many dollars of launch vehicle now becomes trivial, then the cost really is centered on what are you launching? And launching big dumb propellant? Well, that could potentially be a very cheap thing to do rather than launching very fancy expensive ISRU systems that have to survive dusty environments and that have to be autonomous and such. So yes, this trade very much hinges on what does the future launch market look like? And I think one of the other things that we showed here, but that I've also seen show up in other places thinking about the value of in-situ resource utilization is it usually pays off much better closer to home. If the place you're making the resources and the place you're using the resources are very far apart, you tend to lose a lot of those savings you might be realizing in the transportation. In this case, it's getting that propellant you make on the moon all the way up into lunar orbit to be used and then still saving some so that your vehicle can come back down and be used again. So ISRU, yes, it starts becoming something much more focused on supporting a local situation rather than potentially a global solution as launch costs come down. Alan? Thanks, Dr. Jones. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, so it's actually related to the first question. And I noticed in a lot of your contour plots for cost ratio, there are these kind of discontinuities in the slope, right? And mm -hmm. I think earlier on in paper two, there was one where like somewhere around five years duration, there was a big a, a step function in where the where the um, contour went. Um, and I, I understand your response to the first question is there are these sensitivities and like you, you, you sort of trip over a threshold where you need a whole new launch vehicle or a whole new system to get to the next step, right? Mm -hmm. But does that generally point to maybe some value in looking at where those assumptions could be tweaked for relatively little cost for and just to come up with an example if you're running into a limit where a fairing is only so big so so you have a volume constraint and if you if you go above that volume now you need a whole new launch vehicle right mm -hmm. instead for relatively little cost you could just big a, build a bigger fairing on the same launch vehicle right and and that might change some of your cost trade-offs right no, it's a very good point that yep. finding these discontinuities, they first what they do is they show the limitations of the modeling we did. They show that, yes, because we kind of constrain things to allow us to do this trade space exploration, it meant we would have discontinuities. The one here is, as you might be able to tell, there's a five year lifetime going on for the ISRU system here, hence why there's this sharp break at the five year campaign duration. Right. So yes, part of what these could be used for, and it's a very good point that we should explore more, is does this actually tell us that, yeah, the solution is not to do what our set of assumptions automatically took us to do, which is add another vehicle, but now could you go back and recompute, say, what does it look like with a slightly larger fairing, a slightly more capable launch vehicle? Part of that is what we actually wanted to explore in that paper five I talked about, because that discontinuity of sometimes needing a whole nother ISRU system might be mitigated by instead rebalancing the amount of propellant you got from Earth and got from the moon in a way that changes the landscape there. So yeah, it's it's a direction we started to think about going, but I think we could go further to understand where do those discontinuities point us to other assumptions or other trades that could be affecting the results here. Done well. Dr. Jones, so in any of your um, studies, did you guys consider like debris mitigation, like space traffic management type of questions, or is it too kind of out there where it's not even relevant? So I would say it's it's not necessarily any one of those, but we it is true that we didn't really consider it. Um, the nature of what we were looking at was primarily the delivery of either propellant in tankers to cislunar space or to the lunar surface or the delivery of systems that could enable reusability there. So you were going to need to solve problems of like, what do you do with all of those spent stages, whichever of those approaches you take. And one of the things we tried to do to help 
manage the scope of the analysis is say, for those kinds of things that are going to be common problems, regardless of the choice you make, let's leave those off the table. The nature of the Mars campaign or something, we're leaving that off the table beyond just assuming it's going to be something that can use oxygen and hydrogen propellant, because as soon as it's not, as soon as it's a completely different propulsion technology, this trade goes out the window of even being meaningful. So for things like orbit debris mitigation, such we didn't include them mainly because we didn't see them as being drivers of the specific questions we were exploring. So we have a question online. Yeah. Uh, could you say more about nuclear power, power and oxygen and hydrogen propellant power? So nuclear power, what was the second half of that? Uh, versus oxygen and hydrogen propellant power. Ah, yes. So what we assumed here to explore this is the the case that was often made is you're taking ice you're separating it or you're converting it to water separating it into hydrogen and oxygen and using you know chemical rockets burning at about 450 seconds as the propulsion technology of choice there's definitely room to say well what if your propulsion technology of choice for your mars missions is nuclear now Typically, those are usually using hydrogen, but not the oxygen, which means that only a fraction of the propellant you're mining, the you know one eighth or so that hydrogen is relative to oxygen and water, uh, is actually a meaningful propellant to use. So probably ISRU suddenly stops making a lot of sense, even in the cases where it did here, if your propulsion technology becomes a nuclear engine rather than that. On the other hand, maybe there's a world to explore where nuclear rockets using water are going to be significantly lower specific impulse but if water launched into space is copiously available maybe that at least influences the trade-off partially so i would say depending on exactly how open the trade space is switching to a different propulsion technology either takes this question completely out of play or it would have us go and explore a very different dimension than what we looked at so far So this is outside the scope of the research you've presented on today, but I'd be interested to hear your input on the feasibility of harvesting resources on the moon for the purposes of bringing them back and turning a profit, selling them. Yeah, uh, I, I can offer up some opinions that are extremely very only my own and not the official position of NASA. Um, and I think what it comes down to is given the energy demands it takes to say send something from earth to the moon which is the whole motivation or part of the motivation behind the study in the first place is it takes you know at a ballpark 15 kilometers a second of delta v to get something from the earth's surface to the lunar surface well it's going to take the bulk of that same amount of delta v to get something from the lunar surface all the way back to the earth's surface edl might help eat up some of that energy requirement but you're going to then need a good edl technology to do it so there's going to be a high energy cost to pay to move things from the moon back to Earth. So either the technology needs to improve or the volume of things you are returning from moon to Earth needs to grow enough that you could have an economy where that starts paying off and there could be the ability to return things from the moon to Earth profitably. Or the thing you're returning is so valuable that it's worth bringing it through that giant energy scope, which I think is the reason why one of the cases often offered up for the moon is once we have nuclear fusion and we need helium-3 and maybe we can find that on the moon in more meaningful quantities than we can on Earth, maybe that's the business case that pays off. But because of those different factors there, it's a little hard for me right now to see where doing stuff on the moon and returning it at least all the way to Earth's surface or maybe even to low Earth orbit is going to be more economically effective, especially given to John's earlier point that as launch costs go down, the ability to just launch things from Earth, if you need something in space, probably becomes easier and easier than it is even today. So when when you have all these plots and you're talking about like cost ratios and efficiencies and, it, you know, you've got these numbers between zero and one and it's it's kind of very euphemistic in the sense that it's like at, at some point you're doing a campaign mm -hmm. and you're going to put like a dollar amount on the campaign. And when you talk about something where there's a trade off between <clears throat> a city campaign where you wind up sending people to Mars and a campaign where you wind up sending people to Mars and you have a capability, an IRSRU capability on the moon at the end of 10 years, does the absolute number, you know, trying to sell this to somebody, are we talking about the difference between like $30 billion and $35 billion? Because 
that's like an Amtrak and an F-35. Like, why, why not? You yeah. Know, like, is there an argument to be made? And I don't I mean, this is obviously going to be your opinion and not the opinion of NASA. But like, do you consider these kind of things? No, it's, it's a fair point. And really, the only of these studies where we kind of looked at not just that relative comparison, but actually put some orders of magnitudes on things was the very first one here, where the cost difference was 31 billion. And this was to this is the cost to just supply the propellant to do the Mars mission. This didn't factor in at all the costs of all the systems actually doing the Mars mission. Relatively speaking, given that plans for those have, at least in the past, often run into the hundreds of billions of dollars there, yeah, this might actually be a relatively small potatoes decision. And at that point, cost itself is probably not the only driver of the choice we make. Indeed, you know, going back to some of the motivation here at the very beginning, the reason, part of the reason why this is so exciting to people is beyond just a way to reduce mass or save cost, it makes you more capable of doing things in the solar system. And if, as I think a number of people inside and outside of NASA, including myself, have a vision of humanity being able to go out further into the solar system and be able to do things with less direct reliance on Earth, yes, you absolutely want this capability. What we wanted to explore is what does it take to look at this if you're just looking at it on the question of cost without those other values that might actually be as big or if not a bigger driver in the decision like do i want that ability to be self-reliable when i'm out there and i can refuel in other places rather than wait for a supply chain from earth to keep me alive so again i would i would say it's a very valid point or criticism against the the analysis we did because we did limit our scope to a cost-based assessment as opposed to trying to do a full value assessment of what ultimately do we as NASA, do we as a country or even as a species want to do in space and how do we make decisions responding to those goals? Oh, thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was wondering for the cost assessment that you did um, in your model, were you, was there any consideration of uh, perhaps some international entities that are malicious actors that are competing for the same type of resources and any sort of loss that would be propagated to uh, throughout your, your model for the uh, ISRU systems and uh, how that would kind of affect the overall go or no go on whether you'd want to pursue this uh, capability. Is, is that something to consider and is that was that model? So it, it wasn't modeled, but it is an interesting thing and one I know I haven't really spent much time thinking about, so I can't even off the cuff guess on that one. But I think it would be interesting to understand is in a more competitive environment in space, how does that factor in similar to the point there of, you know, there are other factors besides purely the dollars here that are ultimately going to drive this kind of a decision. The nature of our international collaboration and international competition in space, both could inform what it actually makes sense to do. And that's definitely a piece we have not explored. So thanks for that. Yep. All right. In the back. So in, in your Lunar and Mars case, where you have um, some years of uh, ISRU production for lunar purposes and then and then the Mars campaign starts, uh, have you considered the possibility that the uh, experience you have doing ISRU on the moon might give you more confidence of doing ISRU on Mars and and how that might change uh, the the cost if you can uh, produce your return propellant for uh, a Mars mission on the Martian surface. You know, Alex, we were trying to remember the other day what was paper seven. I feel like we actually had started to think about the yes, what's the implications for Mars ISRU? Because that's a very valid point here is if nothing else, even if some of the systems don't necessarily overlap for mining ice on the moon and making propellant on Mars, the operational experience of having systems that are doing that and building an architecture around it yeah, I think that does have a chance to be a very big contributor. And I think, you know, to that theme we talked about earlier of 
typically if you can use the propellant closer to the place you're making it, I've seen and worked on a lot of studies where yes, making your propellant to come home from Mars very much can pay off by doing it with ISRU. And this would potentially have that spinoff benefit of helping mature the systems and buy down risk and get you operational experience. So yeah, that's actually another good direction for us to take this going forward is look at an even bigger integrated picture of what are you doing to your Mars missions if you're doing propellant or if you're relying on Earth all the way until the moment that you're trying to do something 100 million miles away.